Hey friends, Sean Iverson here. We're going to talk about the spinal cord as a means of wrapping up the central nervous system lectures for the paramedic. A couple of things to just kind of highlight, almost housekeeping things. Uh, the anatomy and physiology, so the structure and function that we're going to talk about for the spinal cord, um, is relevant, will be testable in the course. But to give us uh, a means of applying this knowledge and making it a little bit easier, easier to understand and apply it to your practice as a paramedic and EMT, we're going to talk about injuries to the spinal cord. The injuries to the spinal cord are not tested in this course, but they will be tested in the trauma course next semester. And I find when I teach the trauma course that it's actually kind of difficult to memorize the different injuries that occur when the spinal cord has been, been injured. So we're going to learn that here so we can apply the anatomy and physiology, but we're also learning that so that we can start memorizing and working through that concept before it's tested in advanced trauma. So let's dive in. Okay, so we're going to use the same picture all the way through this lecture. So we can identify some of the structures um, right off the bat. We're going to talk about these individual sections of the spinal cord and then also uh, discuss their physiology and in some cases pathophysiology. So <clears throat> we have a key here already. Now the spinal cord wouldn't have blue and red essentially in it. It's made up of white and gray matter, but for our highlights, we have two sides of the spinal cord, and in this picture, we basically have the patient's right side, the spinal cord on the right side, has these 3D structures that are in blue, and the red are flat, and on the left side, we have red elevated and blue flat. That's purely just to show those structures independently. So the things that are in blue here are going to be our ascending pathways, and the descending pathways will be red. So some terms that we want to apply that might be a little bit new to us. Um, when we're talking about the spinal cord, we actually don't use the terms uh, posterior and anterior very often, though I'll mix and match these terms, and I want you to also as well. The spinal cord is subdivided into areas like the dorsal and ventral. So dorsal is referring to posterior and ventral referring to anterior. So in our picture here, we can see uh, that they actually did use um, in their key, their directional compass here, they still use posterior and anterior. So posterior is going to be this section, this is the dorsal region, and the anterior will be here, this is the ventral region, and we can see ventral cortical spinal tract as an example. Now, to help memorize this as well, um, think about the dorsal fin on a shark or a dolphin. That's located on their back. And you can barely see it here. This is, this is just fun. Uh, but the back of the uh, shark, for example, the dorsal fin will give us reference the back of our body, dorsal. Excellent. Let's move on. Okay, so here's our picture. Again, we're going to see it all the way through. So we're going to start defining now some of the structures. So the interior, the area that we have in that H pattern, and in this color, it's not actually gray, it's going to be brown, but the interior is gray matter. And when we're talking about gray matter, think back to the neuron lecture. That sp specifically talks about some of our um, neuron and nervous system cells and specific parts of the neuron as well. So gray matter refers to, think back, what structures from our nervous system? What structures in our nervous system are gray matter? Ah, good job. So gray matter is made up of the cell body, the soma, the dendrites, and then axons if they don't have myelinated sheaths. And if they are myelinated, if they have things like Schwann cells on them, myelinated axons are white matter. So in this picture, we have basically the gray matter here, and then everything else here is going to be white matter, even if it's blue or red, because again, it wouldn't be that way uh, in anatomical correctness. Now the pathways that we have here, ascending versus descending, ascending pathways are going from the body to the brain. So that means that they are sensory uh, neurons and axons. So ascending in that terminology, when we learned about nerves a few lectures ago, uh, we learned that ascending is afferent. It's going at the brain. So pretty easy to memorize here because ascending and afferent both start with the same letter, A, so that makes it a little bit easier for memorization. Now, our descending pathways, like how I did that, comes down, it's descending. Well, descending pathways are the opposite. So there are motor control. So these are uh, neurons and axons that are leaving the brain, going to the spinal cord, and then eventually to some organ in the body to have an effect, right? Efferent, organ, uh, efferent uh, axons have effects on other 
organs. So we notice that descending efferent, that's pretty easy to memorize. We just need to memorize that A, B, C, D, descending, and E, efferent, it's alphabetical. So descending alphabetical efferent. If you have a test question, hint, hint, and it's asking these questions, A for A and D and E will be perfectly uh, acceptable to help you memorize it. Now, you can see the structure, though, has another similarity um, in these categories. So ascending uh, neurons, a lot of the ascending neurons are lateral and posterior. Lateral and posterior, those are our nerve tracts. And the descending are still lateral, but an uh, anterior. And to use our new terms, right? Lateral and dorsal, and lateral and ventral. So this helps us identify with, with patients that have, say, a traumatic injury to their spine. It can help identify, without needing any imaging, a loose reference to what part of the spinal cord is injured based on their signs and symptoms. If we have a patient that's complaining of sensory loss, then we have a couple different areas we can look at, but it probably isn't in our descending pathways. Again, the spinal cord picture we'll use will be the same. So more classification. The columns of white matter are basically making up the nerve tracts. So these are the nerve tracts, these elevated structures, both sensory and motor. And the nerve tracts have a collection of axons that are generally serving some functional um, purpose that's similar. So they're brought together by general function. <clears throat> The nerve tracts here are, again, made up of axons. And remember, these axons are long. So if we have long axons and we want to make sure that we have good, efficient depolarization, we have to deal with the axon having electricity generated that has to go over distance and over time. And so the means of us protecting that is by having axons that are myelinated through the pathway. So that's kind of the gist of the myelinated sheaths and what their, their overall purpose is, is to traverse long distances. There are some axons that start deep in the brain and travel all the way down to the terminating portion of the spinal cord. The spinal cord functions basically as, a, number one, a means of communicating between the brain and the body, taking sensory about the outside and inside environment and making some effect uh, from that decision making. But there's also a pathway, as we recall, from the sensory directly to the motor where there's no thought involved and it happens very quickly. So that's referring to our reflex arcs. And the reflex arcs are housed within uh, the spinal cord. And when we talk about things like the interneuron, remember that was one of the components of our reflex, the interneuron is housed within the spinal cord. So a good example is, and this is functional every day. Um, you're probably not testing your tendons every day, but functional every day. If you put your hand over a, a hot surface or you touch a hot surface, your hand's going to immediately withdraw or should immediately withdraw. That's a very common reflex arc. And so you didn't have to think about, oh, that's hurt. That hurts. What should I do? It's a, mill, a few milliseconds difference probably to get it done in most healthy patients, but uh, it just makes it quicker so that the injury will be less. And then we can think about what we need to do afterwards. Okay, let's talk more about the structure that we're seeing right here in front of us on this cross-section. So um, it's not necessary to memorize all of these different uh, nerve tracts. We do want to know ascending versus descending motor and uh, sensory. We do also want to know a couple of these structures and then obviously our white and gray matter. So in this picture, they have a highlighted basically the gray matter is going to be this brown H-like structure in the center. And then all the rest of this is white matter, meaning myelinated axons uh, traveling through the spine. They're grouped together. That makes up our spinal tracts. And so if they're grouped together, then the neurons have very similar um, functions associated with them. So one of the ones we'll just talk about here is the corticospinal tract. The corticospinal tract is made up of white matter, and it's a motor pathway, as we can see here. It's descending, so that's going away from the brain, uh, a.k.a. efferent pathway. And these tracts are going to originate in the cerebral cortex. That's the cortico part of the term. And they're going to travel through the spinal tract. That's the spinal part of the term. And they're going to terminate somewhere within the spinal cord and may involve some interneurons controlling movement of the limbs and the trunk. Let's look at a couple more uh, of these tracks and also talk about a phenomenon that you probably are aware of just in layman's uh, knowledge of the brain. All right, so uh, 
layman knowledge of the brain spinal cord probably includes a phenomenon that they're aware that control of the right side of our body crosses over and is controlled by the left hemisphere of our brain and the left side of our body crossed over and controlled by the right hemisphere of our brain so that's common knowledge but where that crossover occurs is actually different depending on the spinal tract that we're talking about so we're going to talk about here uh, as an example and we'll have a picture in a moment of our ascending um, spinal tracts so remember to a few slides ago what ascending meant so with our study tool, as I mentioned for you, ascending uh, ha shares the first letter, A, with the other uh, explanation of direction, afferent. So afferent is going at the brain. So that's going to be our ascending afferent sensory tract. So this is communicating from the body to the brain. So the first one we'll talk about is the spinothalamic tract. And the spinothalamic tract has actually a pretty unique structure to it compared to some of the other ascending tracts. I'll get to that in just a second. The spinothalamic name tells you exactly where it is. So this is originating from the spine, communicating, still central nervous system, back up to the thalamus. The thalamus in the brain is a very important structure, and we talk a lot about the hypothalamus, a little bit more so than we talk about the thalamus. The hypothalamus, as you recall, is essentially the area that is responsible for the connection between our endocrine system and our electrical nervous system through the pituitary gland. And in the role of changing things by hormones, the hypothalamus is responsible for things like the thermostat in our body and having our body respond by resetting the thermostat as a fever and or our cooling mechanism or increasing metabolism for our heating mechanism, among other things. So it shouldn't be a surprise to you that the peripheral nervous system component that connects to the spinal cord Cord terminates at the skin. So in effect, the entire tract is going to communicate from the skin, touch pain, and probably not surprising, right, temperature, uh, to the thalamus so that the thalamus can then take action as necessary. The thing that's kind of unique about it, though, for our ascending tracts is that most ascending tracts are lateral and dorsal or posterior. This is actually located lateral and ventral or anterior and you notice there's not any other sensory tracts uh, listed in this diagram in the ventral position so now we've got this sliding over like how i did that i crossed over from the other side it's lame but i gotta you know let me have my thing so the fasciculi here uh, are another means of communicating to the brain and they are ascending tracts we can look at our picture here and see we've got them located right here primarily in the dorsal section and then it has its counterpart on the other side the other hemisphere of the uh, spinal cord so the cunate fasciculus and lingressio fasciculus are basically associated with level t6 and that's communicating for things like proprioception in the limb and trunk above level t6 proprioception probably deserves a little explanation the term proprioception is referring to our body's ability to sense where our body is in space and what the uh, appendages of our body like our arms and legs what their relation is to our core in space so it's sensing essentially things like when we have our patients uh, bring their arms up and hold them out when we're doing the Cincinnati stroke exam and asking them to do a pronator drift. So proprioception is that knowledge that your arms are held out even if you're not looking at them. Visceral pain and deep touch are also associated with the cunate and they're located for that region in T6 and above. Now the gracile fasciculus is going to be the level below starting just below T6 at the vertebrae and it's going to control limit trunk proprioception for that region. It also has, like its counterpart, visceral pain and deep touch. Now both of these structures, both of these tracks are going to cross over in the brain stem and I believe that crossover is in uh, the medulla specifically. Now <clears throat> we can just throw a couple other terms out for us to talk about crossover a little further. So crossover for our descending tracks for our motor tracks that we can see here in red, lateral and anterior. Crossover for those depends, but um, for example, our lateral and anterior corticospinal tracks are going to control fine limb movement, and they cross over in the medulla. The 
uh, lateral specifically crosses over in the medulla and the anterior crosses over in the spinal cord. So <clears throat> knowing that can give us a little bit of knowledge when we see certain signs and symptoms present for things like uh, the patient's got a penetrating injury that isn't affecting the entire spinal cord. We can help to kind of deduce from that what might be injured. Now, no, there's no requirement necessarily to know where all of these things cross over for our examination purposes, but it helps highlight that phenomenon. So let's talk a little bit about spinal cord injuries now that we understand the anatomy and structure overall of the spinal cord. So as a reminder, the spinal cord injuries are not going to be tested this term, but they will next term. So we're using them as an example to apply the knowledge of anatomy and physiology and warming us up for trauma in the next term. Central cord syndrome is referring to an injury that occurs and injures the spinal tract at the center of the spinal cord. The central cord syndrome is a unique presentation, and when the patient has central cord syndrome, often it comes from things like distraction injuries or something like perhaps a hanging, for example. The central cord syndrome is going to produce some signs and symptoms. So the branches to the upper extremities are part of the central nervous, the central portion of the spinal cord. And so the patients that have central cord syndrome will often have weakness, numbness, and burning of their arms and hands. And it may be different regions. It may not be their entire arm and hand, depending on which part of the cord has been injured. Okay, another spinal cord injury uh, is an incomplete spinal cord injury, meaning it's not completely cut the entire spinal cord. Central cord follows that as well. Anterior cord syndrome, uh, also known as ventral cord syndrome, since we have that uh, similar terminology, is going to involve um, this region, essentially. And we can see that's involving things like the ventral spinothalamic tract and our, vertical, our ventral corticospinal tract in the anterior portion of the spinal cord. So because of that and our knowledge of just having described these structures, the corticospinal is communicating motor, so efferent pathway, originating in the cortex and going through the spinal cord. So what ends up happening is the lower extremities are generally impacted more than upper extremities. So we'll see that depending on where this injury is, the lower extremities uh, and the, the level of injury and below will have some motor and then also because of the ventral sp uh, spinothalamic position will have some uh, sensory injuries as well. So for those patients, they generally lose pain and temperature sensation below the level of injury. There's some other things that can happen. Uh, this is also responsible for something called autonomic dysfunction. And so we'll talk a little bit about that in the trauma course the next semester. But what ends up happening here in um, autonomic dysfunction is that our autonomic nervous system, where our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are located, gets sent into overdrive. And that can be a very difficult situation for a patient that has a spinal cord injury. And remember, there's also the mechanism. What caused this? It would be unlikely that just the spinal cord is injured because there's a lot of other, especially for the anterior portion of the spinal cord, there's a lot of other structures and organs in between the outside of the body and this area. So this can be a pretty difficult patient to manage with anterior cord syndrome. Okay, continuing on our discussion of spinal cord injuries, we're going to talk about uh, posterior cord syndrome. So this essentially is opposite of anterior. Another term for this could be dorsal cord syndrome. And because of the structure, if we're having a, a patient that has an injury to this region of their spine, they may not have touched any of the uh, descending pathways. It may just be ascending like the uh, uh, cunate and gracilis uh, fasciculi. So these structures, as we recall, were responsible for things like proprioception. And they're an ascending pathway, so that's a sensation. The motor and pain and light touch are preserved. The motor especially because most of the motor tracts are, or our descending tracts are located in the anterior portion of the spinal cord. Now, they could have, if it's such a deep injury of the posterior, they could have some involvement to the lateral corticospinal uh, tract. That may or may not be present. If motor control is not present, we're not sure necessarily without some further assessment uh, which part of the spine is injured. Now, 
one of the probably harder terms uh, or injuries to memorize is brown saccard. Brown saccard does, in its name, doesn't have anything that's telling us where it's located, but we can memorize that this is the specific injury that will involve left versus right. So it's a unilateral injury of one side of the spinal cord. So because there's different crossover regions, brown saccard can have a few different presentations. So if the region is where the um, spinal tracts are ipsilateral, meaning injury is on the same side of the body or symptoms are on the same side of the body as the injured spinal cord. So if the spinal cord and brown saccard is injured on the patient's left side, left side, so this region here, then some functions will be motor function proprioception loss will be on the same side of the body. But pain and temperature sensation are going to be on the opposite side of the body. In our case, if it's a left-sided uh, unilateral injury, then they'll have pain and temp sensation loss on the right side of the body, but motor function and proprioception loss on the same side of the body. So this is obviously pretty tricky. You're going to have to do a very thorough assessment if you suspect that you have an incomplete spinal cord injury to determine, or a complete spinal cord injury, to determine the extent and which structures are injured. This picture here is showing us our spinal cord and the spinal nerves that are branching off of it. So we have a couple terms for nerves. We have things like our peripheral nerves. Those are nerves that are attached to the spinal cord's nerves, but they exist outside of the central nervous system. So they're communicating basically with the rest of the body or from the body to the spinal cord. Then we have, which we'll learn in the next uh, lesson, we have things like our cranial nerves. The cranial nerves are also part of the, the uh, peripheral nervous system, and they're essentially extensions of the cranium, the head, uh, the cranial nerves, very high, very close to our brainstem. Now, spinal nerves are shorter nerves that branch off directly. The axons are essentially traveling from somewhere in the brain and traveling and branching off in between the vertebrae and then communicating with nerves through the rest of the body. So the spinal nerves that we can see in this actual picture, this cross-section is showing our uh, posterior or dorsal portion of the spinal cord. And we have the vertebrae that have been cut so that we can see it. You can see that the vertebrae, the bones here, are um, separated. That's generally through these uh, intercalated discs that are, work as shock absorbers and a means of making sure that we have fluid movement without tearing down bone. But in between the vertebrae is where the nerves are exiting. These bulbs that we see here those are the ganglion that I mentioned a little bit earlier. So the ganglion are our communication link. That's essentially where the spinal nerves are now going to communicate with our peripheral nervous system. Note that the spinal cord actually ends at about the level of um, thoracic vertebrae T12 or L1. And then we have this big bundle of nerves that's called the quadra equina. We'll talk about that specific section of the spinal cord in just a moment. So this gives us a little bit of a picture of what might happen. Imagine if this vertebrae here was fractured and the fracture had pieces of bone that weren't all together. They were starting to migrate away and so sharp edges of bone when the person moves could cut and sever this nerve. And we know that nerves are very hard to repair. They don't grow back easily. Uh, so if a nerve is lost, it may be lost permanently for the rest of that patient's life. So we can have that. Imagine though that we have a different injury. Maybe they dove into a pool and this is in their, uh, their cervical vertebrae. They dove into a pool and they ruptured some of their intervertebral discs and then had these two bones crushed together with a lot of force. Now these bones have done two major things to the nerve. One, they crushed and pinched the nerve when they were forced together. And when these bones impact each other, they're going to fracture. So now we could have uh, lacerations of the nerve, um, complete or partial. So it gives us a little bit of knowledge when we're assessing our patients that we suspect have, especially cervical vertebral injuries, what we need to be aware of in packaging the patient. Now we're going to talk in the next semester about things like backboarding our patient because we're undergoing some evolution in that area. But if the patient is moving around and they have vertebrae that are sharp or crushed, the risk is that when they turn their head, they cut this nerve. And if that nerve communicates with, say, their diaphragm, they may not be able to breathe uh, on their own after that injury. So we need to be very careful with patients we suspect have spinal cord injuries. You can see some of the spinal cord, uh, spinal nerves rather, in the Complete Anatomy app, and I've got a video there on the spinal cord itself.
So when we have a spinal cord injury, if the injury cuts the uh, individual spinal nerves or cuts across the entire spinal cord and separates it from above and below, at the point of injury and below, the patient will have generally some loss of sensation and may have loss of the ability to move. So those terms are anesthesia and paralysis. So when the patient has a, a injury and we'll say it's a complete cord transection, the spinal cord has been com completely cut uh, across the entire region, then the motor communication from the brain down to the extremities isn't going to work and the sensation back to the brain from those areas is also not going to work. That's the hallmark of what's going on in these injuries. And again, this isn't something that's uh, e that can be generally repaired. So this will highlight patients that may be, uh, may be qualified as a paraplegic or qual uh, a quadriplegic. A paraplegic generally has loss of sensation and movement in their lower extremities, but their upper extremities are still functioning. A quadriplegic has no movement of any of their extremities and no sensation. Now there's a tricky piece here. It depends on where their spinal cord is cut, whether or not they're going to be a para or quadriplegic. Also, quadriplegics could be uh, in, a, in a category that has complete control of their breathing, just cannot move their extremities or sensation. Or if it's a very high transection of the cervical vertebrae, generally around the level of, of C5 or above, then that patient may have severed the nerves that communicate with the lungs and the intercostal muscles so that they can breathe. So there's a difference between a quadriplegic who can breathe on their own and a quadriplegic who requires external ventilation. All of those things are, are as you can imagine, uh, devastating injuries to the patient's life. So we've got some more CNS nerves here, and so the nerves that I, I do want you to actually focus on um, in the, the spinal and the peripheral we're going to highlight here. So <clears throat> what we have with these larger bundles are plexi. Plexi are bundles of nerves, which within them have bundles of axons traveling uh, to intersect with different regions of the body. So the cervical plexus is going to exit, as you can see here, C1 through 5. It's going to exit at the cervical vertebrae and control movement of the neck, the head, and the shoulders. Now, a, a worrisome situation is this phrenic nerve here. The phrenic nerve is exiting right around the level of C5 and C6, and that's a nerve that communicates directly with our diaphragm and intercostal muscles. So as mentioned, when we have a quadriplegic that has an injury and they're not breathing, that means that their injury was probably above, at or above the level of C5 and C6. Below the level of C6, that patient now has the ability, if that's where their injury is, they have the ability to breathe on their own because this nerve is still intact as it exits, the phrenic nerve specifically. But if it's high enough, say six, C6, C6, 7, 8, or at the T1 level, the brachial plexus, which is gonna communicate with the chest, shoulders, arms, and hands, may not be communicating with the rest of the body. And so at that point, they become a quadriplegic. If it's not communicating with the brachial plexus, it's certainly not communicating with the lumbar, sacral, or other uh, plexi. As we look towards the nerves that are listed here, I like this picture because it's got just basically the core nerves and plexi that we want to worry about. So please do know the phrenic nerve and where it exits. As an EMT basic, you probably learned a little bit of a, a rhyme, if you will. There's a rhyme that's highlighted, and that rhyme uh, is to help tell us if we're learning about cervical injuries, like they've got a complete cord transection in the cervical vertebrae. If we're learning about that, we want to memorize where that differentiation is. So often they'll say something along the lines of C1 through 5, stay alive. So if we have an injury in that area, it's going to impact their ability to survive. They may asphyxiate because they can no longer breathe no matter how hard they think about breathing with their voluntary or involuntary control. C6, pick up sticks. So that identifies that if we have an injury at C6, then we will lose the ability to move our arms and legs so we can't pick up sticks anymore, but we can still breathe. That's essentially what it's getting at. The axillary, median, radial, and ulnar nerves are all going to communicate essentially with the shoulder and the lower extremities. The radial nerve and the ulnar nerve are going to eventually extend to the forearm and the hand. The radial nerve is going to run along the, excuse me, 
run along the uh, radius, which remember, if you're trying to just easily identify in yourself, if you hold your hand out and you make a fist and put your thumb up, like you're giving someone the thumbs up, that's all controlled by the radial nerve. The ulnar nerve is going to be the lower portion of the hand, so essentially uh, at the point <clears throat> of the ring finger and pinky, pinky down the line, and Underneath the radial artery, we'll find the ulnar bone. The ulnar bone is essentially where the ulnar nerve is uh, protected and communicating through. So a patient that has an injury just to the ulnar nerve may find that their pinky and ring finger, and sometimes a portion of their middle finger, uh, are numb or tingling. This happens especially if the patient's had not a cord transection, but they've been in an accident and maybe their hyperextension that occurred uh, when their head moved back in what layman's refer to as whip flash, that may have pinched this nerve. And so that might be uh, a individual sign and symptom as opposed to something like quadriparaplegics. If we look down here, the femoral nerve, the arbitrator nerve, and our sciatic nerve are all important, especially the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve is going to communicate on each side of the lower extremities. It's going to communicate with that entire extremity. This is a common nerve that's injured when patients have low back injuries within uh, the lumbar. The sciatic nerve will produce numbness to pain. And it's interesting, this nerve might be pinched. And if it's pinched, that means there's direct pressure on the nerve. And that will send a pain signal to the brain. That pain can shoot all the way down the patient's leg on the affected side and may not be something that can be relieved. Treatment for things that include our lower back injuries and sciatica, the term for injury to the sciatic nerve, could include surgery. Also may include distraction, the person kind of being put out on, on a device that stretches their, their vertebrae out a little bit. Um, if it's got a impingement on the nerve, the nerve is going to swell because of the injury and the inflammation process. So they may inject locally or have the patient take something like a steroid, which reduces inflammation. This could be something that an EMT, paramedic, firefighter, any of us experience if we move incorrectly. A friend of mine um, who worked for fire, still works for fire department, uh, kind of got lucky on this. He injured him, his lower back and had sciatica as a result. What was he doing? He was working with one other partner and they were working a cardiac arrest. He leaned over, he was on his knees and he turned his uh, upper body, um, turned it along the axis so that he could reach the life pack. I think it was a life pack 12 at that time, reach the life pack that was essentially to his side and a little behind him. So imagine turning to get that while you're kneeling down. When he lifted it up, his body was not in a proper position to lift this 30-pound life pack. And certainly he was uh, an in-shape uh, gentleman. He picked up that life pack, and as soon as he did that, he pinched essentially pinched his sciatic nerve and caused long-term damage. He wasn't sure if he was going to be able to be a paramedic after that because if he had chronic sciatica and lower back injury, he may not qualify for work. And some folks end up completely disabled uh, because of it. Luckily for him, his regiment of uh, steroids, having some distraction applied to his vertebrae, um, and I don't believe he had surgery, but he did have physical therapy has relieved some of the pressure, but it hasn't made it all go away. So for the rest of his life, he'll probably have to deal with his sciatic nerve or sciatica inflammation. This could happen to any of us. It's when we turn our body slightly and we try to lift something to our side. When we do that, we actually displace the uh, intervertebral disc and can cause a slip disc or sciatica or worse, um, injuries to larger portions of the vertebrae. There's some pictures highlighted uh, in the complete anatomy of our phrenic nerve, the mediastinum portion of the phrenic nerve, and then the posterior neck tri triangle nerves, all the nerves that are essentially within the cervical and brachial plexus. This is just an additional uh, reference here. This is from um, an open learning initiative at Carnegie Mellon University, and it basically highlights the uh, plexi most of the plexi, the spinal nerves that contribute. So we can see the cervical plexus has C1 through C5. And these are the actual nerves originating. You don't necessarily need to memorize all of these, but have a good understanding for the phrenic nerve coming from the cervical plexus at C1 and C5. Axillary, radial, and ulnar nerves at the brachial plexus, C5 through C8. That's primarily where those will branch off, but also branches at T1. Our lumbar with our femoral, T1 to T4, and then finally sacral, uh, where we'll find com uh, components of the sciatic nerve branching off L4 through L5 and S1 and S4.
Now there's another region of our spinal cord that's at the very distal portion of the spine. So <clears throat> excuse me. Remember that most of the spinal cord is going to branch off here uh, at the level of around L1. Not all, but most will branch off at the level of L1. And it creates this big chunk of nerves that are highlighted here. So in this picture, we are looking from pos posterior or from dorsal towards ventral or anterior, and the vertebrae have been removed to expose this. The lower vertebrae attaching from the lumbar to the sacrum, the lower vertebrae become quite wide so that they can accommodate this branching of nerves. So the quadra equina is a collection of nerves that's going to communicate with our lower extremity and the organs inside of our pelvis. Quadra equina syndrome is actually a syndrome that we're mandated to teach. So when a patient has an injury to the quadra equina, there's some very specific signs and symptoms that will present themselves because of the actual communicating or innervation with the nerves that are in the pelvis. It's not just lower extremities, it's also the pelvis. So that means that if an injury uh, occurs to the quadra equina, um, we'll have things like incontinence because the two anal sphincters are both controlled by the quadra equina. Also, the parasympathetic innervation of the bladder, so they may be fecal or um, urine incontinent. It can impact the genitalia, and because of that, have a product, product of it erectile dysfunction in the male. They may lose sensation of their lower extremities and lose the ability to use some of their leg muscles. Specifically, if a patient has quadra equina syndrome, um, they may not be able to move from sitting down to standing up because of the, the muscles that have to be activated in the hip and lower extremity, all being controlled essentially by the quadra equina. Finally, two slides here. We've got uh, our presentation of where fluid is. So the fluid is going to be generated within these ventricles. Don't make the mistake of thinking that ventricles is only for the heart. Ventricle is basically the term uh, is describing a space within the tissue. So this is a, a physical space that is occupied by cerebral spinal fluid. And remember, our Vent, uh, ventricles have tissue, choroid plexus, that are creating uh, the cerebral spinal fluid. In the brain, it circulates throughout and then travels through the central canal of the spinal cord, that small hole right in the center surrounded by gray matter in that H shape. So that's where we have our initial pathway traveling down through the spinal cord, and it'll circulate and return. Now, this is going to highlight not just the ventricle circulation, but then circulating through the meninges. So as the fluid circulates through the meninges, it's going to create a physical space that is separating the meninges. We can see here that it's basically separating the dura from the pia matter and is traveling through the entire route of the brain. The choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle is one of the areas that creates, as well as the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle, where cerebral spinal fluid is made. Now, with all those tidbits of information, we've wrapped up our central nervous system discussion. We've covered the neuron, how the neuron does its work, how nerves and neurons become nerve fibers and bundles, how that becomes our central nervous system, the area, regions, and functions of our brain, and finally, the spinal cord. All right, so move on. I wish you luck on your reading, and you'll be working on some quizzes to get this done. Let me know if you have any questions. We'll see you soon.